There's a drive way back. It might be. It could be. It is. Hello again, everybody. This is Harry Carey. With Jack Buck, I was behind the microphone as Gas House Baseball and the National League pennant returned to St. Louis for the first time in 18 years. Hey, there's a drive! Way back! It's gonna go to the wall! Holy cow! What run is in? <laughs> I can't believe it! Roger Craig hit the left center field wall! The Cardinals are gonna win this pennant! Harry, I know we weren't as sure as you sounded with that prediction. You made it in April on a cool, windy Friday night in Frisco during the Cardinals' third game of the year. And it wasn't until October and the last day of the season that it all came true. A team that at midseason had trailed by as many as 13 games battled back to win it all in as thrilling and hectic a climax as baseball has ever known. Perhaps thrills as great as those of summer 64 can never be completely recaptured, Jack. But we've tried, and you're about to hear what we feel are some of the highlights of the season as they sounded when the action took place. Maybe we'd like to change a few words now after hearing them again, but this is what was heard on the Cardinals baseball network as the Redbirds fought their way to the flag. Jack, it was a season in which every victory was awfully important and every defeat a real tragedy. But in looking back, now that the heat of battle has abated, one of the games that looms large in my mind is the come-from-behind victory we registered against Sandy Koufax and the Dodgers on a sultry mid-season Friday night in St. Louis. That was a dandy, all right. We trailed 7-1 to one early in the ballgame, but instead of riding it off, the Redbirds came bouncing back, and after three hours and 15 minutes of baseball, we had moved to within a run, had runners at second and third with two out in the ninth, and had Bob Skinner at the plate against ex-Cardinal Bobby Miller. Into the windup he goes. Here it is. A base hit! One run is in! Here's the winning run! The Cardinals win! The Cardinals win! The Cardinals win! Holy cow! The Cardinals win it! Eight to seven! Without that one, who knows where our guys would have spent mid-October. One of my most vivid memories of the 64 season also occurred in July in Pittsburgh. It was our first and best rhubarb with the men in blue. Here's Harry. There's a stretch. The pitch. A bouncing ball to the first baseman. Here's Brock trying to score. He knocks the catcher over and he's safe. He's safe. Virgil forgot about the play at the plate. And McFarland really had that plate blocked off. And Brock got in there and turned the somersault. He went head over heels and turned over. Hey, a man from third base is on the play. How can that be? I couldn't either, Jack, but it felt a little bit better when we went on to win that ball game. I remember National League President Warren Giles sent you season's greetings before we finished rehashing that one. We had good days and bad ones as the season rolled along, and perhaps the lowest point of all occurred the evening of June 5th in Cincinnati as Glenn Hobby, just acquired from the Chicago Cubs, made his first Cardinal start. At the start of the evening, things looked wonderful. Not only did Hobby's arm appear to be good, but so did his bat. Now the pitch on the way. There's a drive. Deep left field. Way back. It might be out of here. Harper near the fence. It could be. It is. A home run for Hobby. We had a 4-1 to one lead in the ninth when Hobby ran out of gas. Roger Cray came striding out of the bullpen to face Tommy Harper. The bases were loaded. There was one out. Craig gets set. Here's the windup. Here's the pitch on the way. He didn't mean to swing, a little roller down the third base. Right through Boyer's way. One run in, two runs in. Another man goes to third. Harper didn't even want to swing. The ball was hit that softly, he fell away. The ball hit his bat, rolled down the third baseline. How it ever got through Boyer, he himself will never be able to tell you. He must have looked up to see what play he would have, and two runs score on it, and the tying runs now at third, and still only one out. After that, Pinson was intentionally passed, and Bobby Shantz came on to face left-handed hitting Gordy Coleman. But instead, it was a right-handed hitter, Darren Johnson, who stepped in, and Redbird fortunes were about to sink to a new low. There's the wind, here's the pitch. 
There's a base hit up the middle, and the Reds are going to win the ball game. Here's the winning run scoring, the throw to the plate. The Reds win. Darren Johnson, single to center. Five. I don't know how you can lose some of these ball games, but we do. So the Reds, almost unbelievable. And it's all over. The Reds score four in the ninth and beat the Cardinals five to four. That was the second of a four-game losing streak. But about that time, as the Cardinals sputtered and faltered, unable to gain momentum, another acquisition from the Cubs, Lou Brock, began to assert himself in all phases of the game. He was a consistent 300 hitter. Not a great outfielder, but a fellow with a flair for making the big play. Slow ball swung on, a drive back to left. Way back is Brock, he jumps. Holy cow, did he make the catch or not? Yeah, he's got the ball. The game is over. Lou Brock, a spectacular leap through the air. Boy, he jumped higher than the fence. He lost his cap. And very uh, nonchalantly, he didn't show the ball at all. He walked over and picked up his cap. And it was only then that everybody realized that he had caught the ball. A spectacular catch to end the game with. And oh, how he could run. There's the stretch. And the pitch to Dick Groat. There goes a runner. Low into the dirt. There'll be no play. A stolen base for Brock. A curveball that broke into the dirt. So Brock has now stolen 16 bases already this year. And his blinding speed seemed to ignite the spark as suddenly Gas House baseball came back to Bush Stadium. The pitch to Skinner. Swung on and a bouncing ball to first base. I don't think they'll get two. Out at second. Safe at first and the run scores. And the Phillies charge out and argue about the call. Now another man trying to score, and Brock is, Brock is safe at the plate. Now Boyer's going to third, and the ball's thrown into left field. Boyer rounds third base. Yes, Gas House baseball was back, and suddenly the Cardinals were making an amazing drive. And the season moved into that final hectic week. Remember how it was? You fans opened your morning paper on September 28th. Cincinnati led by one over the fading Phillies and by one and a half over the on-rushing Cardinals. An ironic twist was developing in St. Louis as the Cardinals got ready to host the Phillies. One year earlier, nearly to the day, St. Louis had opened a crucial homestand on a Monday night, that time against the Los Angeles Dodgers, who led us by a game. We lost all three on that occasion, and the Dodgers breezed home to win it all. This time, another homestand was opening on a late September Monday night, and again, in the clutch. The way things started for the Cardinals, you had horrible visions of a rerun. Bouncing ball, he's got a chance to beat it out. Hey, Boyer and Grove collide, and it goes for a hit. But this was a different year. Bob Gibson shook that one off as Rookie of the Year Richie Allen stepped in. There's the double play ball to Grote. Javier, one. First base, two. From Grote to Javier to White. It was scoreless in the second when Bill White, a first half flop and a second half sensation, stepped to the plate. Here's Bill White. There's a shot to right, a base hit. He might have to hold it first, and he does. The first Cardinal hit by White is a solid single to right. Next, it was Julian Avier. Avier digs in. The stretch. And the pitch. Ground ball up the middle, center field, base hit. White around second, on his way to third. The Cardinals have runners at first and third. Veteran Chris Short got ahead of young Mike Shannon. Two strikes, no balls. Here's the stretch. And the pitch. There's a high fly ball. Deep left field. Way back. It's going to be caught. A run score. Sacrifice fly. The Cardinals never lost that lead. It was 5-1 in on the ninth before the Phillies made their move. The first two men reached base against a tiring Gibson. And out of the bullpen came 41-year-old Barney Schultz. Harry Carey was at the microphone as Schultz faced Clay Dalrymple. There's the pitch. Hot shot to White. He's got it. Second base, one. First base, two. Double play. Johnny Hernstein faced the veteran knuckleballer next. Barney Schultz winds. Here it is. Pop 
popped up. We got this ball game. Bill White waiting. And the Cardinals win. The Redbirds are only one game out of first place. So, Jack, we had passed Philadelphia, but the idle Cincinnati club still led. The Cardinals simply couldn't afford to lose. Young Ray Sadecki got the pitching assignment the next night, and after the Cardinals had scrambled to a 3-2 sixth inning lead, it was again Bill White who provided the insurance. The pitch is made by Boozer, and there's a drive to deep right center field. Way back, way back, near the clock. Home run for Bill White into the seats. was looking for a ball to pull. He got a fastball and he drilled it into the pavilion seats just below the clock beyond the 354 mark and back about five rows to put the Cardinals out in front four to two. And again the call went out to Borny Schultz. And Jack what a job he did in those final few days. On that occasion he worked beautifully through the seventh and eighth. We were sweating our ball game out and keeping an eye on the Reds as Schultz towed the rubber in the ninth. Pete Rose is the hitter with a runner on first and two out on the bottom of the ninth at Cincinnati. Three balls, two strikes. Here's a signal given. Barney Schultz winds. Here's the pitch to Triandis now. He stuck him out, swinging. Triandis goes down swinging. Two more and it'll all be over. Johnny Callison was next. One ball, no strike. Here's the pitch on the way. A high fly ball, deep left center field, flood going out. Brock is there. Lou's got it. Two out. That's two gone. And it all ended on a high note. Here's the pitch. A bouncing ball to Boyer. He's got it. Here's the throw. Cardinals win it. And look at those Redbirds bouncing around. The Cardinals have won their ball game, four to two. Pittsburgh has won. Pittsburgh won this ball game, two to nothing. It's over. Pittsburgh has just beat the Reds, two to nothing. The National League race is in a tie. Holy cow! Never has it been a more thrilling moment. Within 15 seconds after the Cardinals won. Mazeroski threw out Ruiz, and the Pirates shut out the Reds two to nothing. The National League race is all tied up, and the Phillies in third place stay only a game and a half out. That set the scene for Wednesday night, with Kurt Simmons opposing Jim Bunning as our Cardinals went for the sweep. The honorary mayor of Memphis, Tennessee, Tim McCarver, gave us a second inning lead. Two balls and a strike. Here's a pick. There's a drive way right back. It might be. The Cardinals lead two to nothing. And that lead stood up. Another lefty, rookie Gordon Richardson, relieves Simmons when the Phillies threaten mildly in the late going. Here's how it ended. Two balls, two strikes. From the belt, the pitch. Here it is. A bouncing ball. They should do it. The Cardinals are in first place. The Redbirds win it eight to five. Gordon Richardson being congratulated. As Bobby Wine bounced to Grode, who tossed to Javier for the force off. And now the pressure has been put on by the Cardinals. The Cardinals have taken over first place, pending the outcome of the Cincinnati game. That one really did some pending. Until past 1 a.m., as Harry and I sat in a darkened and deserted Bush Stadium. We were receiving direct reports from Cincinnati on the progress of that game was in the top of the 16th, still a scoreless duel. A rookie catcher named Jerry May was hitting for the Pirates. And we, like you, heard this good news. He had the big run there at third. The ball is butted on the squeeze. We score! We score! Jerry May executed a perfect squeeze, but they were looking for anything but that, and the Fox put on the suicide squeeze. Turned down and broke. And the ball was butted perfectly along third. And the 
the Pirates lead one to nothing. Harry Carey was his usual calm and collected self as we listened to the bottom of the 16th. McBean, upon occasion, you know, has uh, been called a hot dog. He calls himself that. But uh, one time he said, you think I'm a hot dog now? Wait till I win 20. <laughs> <laughs> One-two pitch. Uh, ground ball. Schofield's got it at second. Throws. And it was off the bag, but Clendenin grabbed and tagged him. One out. Two more. Let's go. A one, two, three, and out. No thrills. Uh, you've worked. Uh, you've done a tremendous job, Jim. There's a ground ball. Hit the Schofield. The duck is up. Throw to first. Two outs, Harry. One more, baby. <laughs> two men out. One more out. And your Redbirds will be in first place. You can see the pressure on the Bucks. I mean, Verdon is walking around in circles out in center field. Moda was doing the same thing in right. And Mazarowski drawing little designs with his feet down at second base. No balls, two strikes on Pinson. McBean is ready. Here comes the pitch to Veda. It's a ground ball to the right side. Mazarowski has it. You're in first place, Harry. <laughs> Excited we all were, Jack. And now the Cardinals led by one. But Thursday, the Reds bounce back and the lead was down to a slim half game as the last place New York Mets came to town for the final three games of the season. On Friday, everybody lost. Gibson was shut out one to nothing by Al Jackson, and the Phillies came out of their trance and beat Cincinnati. Saturday, well, we'd rather not talk about Saturday. The Reds tied things while taking the day off as a supposedly inept Mets bombed the Cardinals 15 to five. So we were right back where we started on opening day, April the 14th, tied for the lead. And it all boiled down to October the 4th, 1964. And so the whole season had come down to one day, one game. Still hopeful, trailing by one, the Phillies went at it again in Cincinnati. While in St. Louis, a grim group of Redbirds behind Kurt Simmons again faced a loose, relaxed bunch of Stengelites who knew they were going nowhere but home when it ended. But nobody in our club had done any packing. A second inning Mike Shannon single and a fourth inning Charlie Smith homer had things knotted at one to one as the Cardinals batted in the fourth. Dick Grote let off with a double, but McCarver and Shannon were unable to move him along. That brought Dal Maxfield to the plate. He was hitting only 222 and in the lineup only because of an injury to Javier. Too bad the youngster had to be hitting in the clutch. There's the stretch. And the pitch to Maxville, here it is. Line drive, base hit. Here's a man gonna try to score. Here's Jim Hickman up with the ball. And he scores, the Cardinals lead two to one. The Phillies led Cincinnati four to nothing and the Cardinals had a slim lead. It didn't hold up. With a runner at second and one away in the fifth, Simmons appeared to get Bobby Klaus on an easy pop fly. But wait a minute. The delivery on the way. There's a high pop fly that should be caught by somebody. Maxville is there. He's under the ball. Oh, he lets it drop. And here's a runner on third holding up. Klaus winds up at second base. Shannon could have caught the ball. But Maxville had called for it. And the wind grabbed it. Come on, Mike, take those kind. <laughs> Gee, an easy pop fly. Now they have the leading run at second, the tying run at third. They put those runners elsewhere in a hurry, thanks to a tough little competitor named Roy McMillan. Infield in. Can Simmons pitch out of this? He's behind the hitter, two balls and nothing. Now he's ready. Into the windup he goes, and here's the pitch on the way. Line drive's gonna score both, and the Mets have taken the lead. Into the corner, McMillan's on his way to second base. A double to left, and the Cardinals trail three to two. McMillan, a tough hitter in the... And now both of the two of the teams, right now, <laughs> if everything would end the way it is now, there'd be a triple tie starting tomorrow in Philadelphia. And so the Cardinals had to come from behind. But that was nothing new for our club. They'd been doing it all year. Lou Brock started it all with a walk. Bill White singled him to second. And then Kenny Boyer came to the plate. Have you ever heard anyone say about Boyer? Oh, well, he can't get the big hit. Now the stretch. And the pitch to Boyer. 
A hot shot. Left field. Base hit. The tying run is in. Here's another man racing for third. There goes Boyer to second with a double. The Cardinals have tied it up. The Mets change pitchers at this point, bringing ex-Cardinal farmhand Bill Wakefield into the fray. And while all this was going on in St. Louis, the Phillies wrapped things up against Cincinnati as Richie Allen hit his second homer of the day and the Phillies jumped into an insurmountable 9-0 lead. Grote bounced out as the tie-breaking run scored. McCarver walked and Shannon fanned. But Maxville again came through with a single. That drove in the run that put us ahead 5-3. Bob Gibson was on the mound, pitching with only one day's rest. He had staggered through the sixth, walking home the run that made it 5-4. He was pitching with more heart than stuff. It was obvious the Cardinals needed more runs. After Flood went out to start the bottom of the inning, Lou Brock stepped up. The windup now, the pitch is on the way. A line drive, base hit in the left center. He might be able to get a double out of it. He's around first. He's going to try for second. Here's Altman's throw. He is safe. So Brock doubles in the left center. He just took advantage of Altman's weak throwing arm. Here now is Bill White. A man in scoring position with one out. The Cardinals leading by a run five to four. The stretch. And the pitch. There's a drive. Way back. It might be. It could be. It is. A home run. Listen to the crowd. Look at those Redbirds in that dugout. Everybody's standing up. And the Cardinals lead 7-4 to four now. Where is that a happy dugout? Gibson did the job in the seventh and again in the eighth. It was now nine to four as the Mets came up for their ninth inning cuts. They KO'd Bob Gibson, who had gone as long and as hard as he could. With two outs and a run in, Barney Schultz was again in the ball game, pitching to Ed Cranepool. Harry was working from a field box next to the Redbird dugout and with the Cardinals' official family. And in a jam-packed Bush Stadium, 18 years of frustration was about to be swept away in one thrilling, dramatic, unforgettable moment. Listen to this crowd. Come on, come on. Let's go. Get him out. Gussie Bush wasn't excited, was he? Now the stretch. Ready, everybody standing up. The pitch. A high pop foul. The Cardinals there. The Cardinals won the pennant. The Cardinals won the pennant. The Cardinals won the pennant. Everybody out. Johnny. Everybody congratulating everybody. I don't know if they'll ever get here. I don't know if they'll ever get here. The Cardinals have just won the pennant. Mayhem on the field. Joe Schultz, congratulations. Hey, hey, hey. hey Ray Washburn. Hey, Bob Skinner. Hey. Oh, hey, Tim. Timmy. Hey, Tim. Timmy. Hey, Tim. Come here. How about the boy? That was the greatest thing I've ever had. clubhouse in a moment. That clubhouse was as wild as the impromptu on the field celebration you just heard. The first guy you got to Harry was the veteran up from Jacksonville who handled the bullpen heroics in those final frantic weeks, Barney Schultz. Barney can talk a little more now. How are you feeling? Harry, I'm feeling great. It's great. What a thrill, huh? Well, Harry, not so much a thrill as getting them out in the ninth inning. After all, we had a seven-run lead. But the fact that it was a pennant Riding on every pitch, regardless of the lead that we had, it was the greatest ball game I ever completed in my life. Then Cardinal coach and now Redbird manager, Red Chainingst was a happy fellow too. What a thrill, huh? Great, great. It's a good thing we won it this way. Uh, of course, Cincinnati got beat today, but uh, it wasn't like if we'd have won the first game here and got beat today and walked in it. This is more exciting, I think, Harry. How about this ball cup in the World Series? What do you think? Well, we got a good chance. Bill White took the honors as the calmest Cardinal. And you feel so cool, man. Well, we won. That's why we lose, and I don't feel too good. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you uh, feel about the World Series, Bill? Well, we play them just like we played this season, Harry, one at a time, and uh, of course we played the Yankees before spring training. And uh, I think uh, we know uh, 
Uh, most of course, no. I think they know most of ours. Yeah. So uh, it should be a good series. Uh, Bill, uh, it's something for a team to bounce back after losing two ball games like you did to the Mets. The pressure, the chips are really down today, and they're really banged out of it. Well, we hadn't gotten too many hits uh, in, in the other series, or we hadn't scored so many runs, so you, the law of average says we've got to get some runs. And uh, we were forcing to get good pitching from Gibson and, uh, for a while, and then Barney Jones came in. And uh, it was just a good, uh, it was a good victory and a good one to win. Congratulations on a great year, Bill. Thank you, Harry. Which isn't over yet, though. No, we still got another week. <laughs> Jack, although most of it is unintelligible, my favorite chat, the one I think best depicts the hilarious frenzy of that Cardinal dressing room, is this interview with Mike Queller and Bob Euchre. I talked to Mike without an interpreter. This takes some. Oh, hey, con hey, congratulations. Hey, there you go, there you go, there you go. Wow, what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. You're big. You're Mucho dinero. Yeah, mucho, mucho dinero. <laughs> hey, you, Bob. Who is he? Bob Euchre, who's got everybody here. Uh, what do you got? You gonna paint a house? Here we are in the Cardinal Clubhouse with <laughs> <laughs> along with Jack Buck. <laughs> This is beautiful, Harry. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Bonita. <laughs> The proud Cardinal owner, August A. Bush, Jr., made a prediction following the clinching of the pennant. Mr. Bush, <laughs> congratulations. How do you feel? I never was happier in all my live-long life, Harry, and by gosh, after 18 years, we're now able to return to our fine fans, a real pennant team, and we're going to win the World Series. The Cardinals set about trying to do that when the series opened October the 7th in St. Louis. The Cardinals routed Whitey Ford, pounded out 12 hits, and with Ray Sadecki getting relief help from Barney Schultz, went on to a 9-5 victory. The hero of the day was young Mike Shannon, who belted a homer off the scoreboard with a man on. It wasn't so pleasant on Thursday, as the Yankees evened things up with an 8-3 victory behind rookie right-hander Mel Stottlemyre. A disputed call by umpire Bill McKinley gave the Yankees a big sixth-inning run and set up more. But Gibson ran out of gas in that sixth, and Redbird relievers just didn't have it. Sharing honors with Stottlemyre, was harmonica playing shortstop Phil Linz, who chipped in with three hits, one of them a homer. Saturday, October the 10th, marked the third game of the series and the first in Yankee Stadium. Kurt Simmons for the Cardinals and Jim Bouton for the Yankees. Both worked effectively. Termites seemed to have invaded the Cardinal bat rack in critical situations. Simmons drove in our only run, and we had a man reach third in the sixth, seventh, and ninth. In each of those situations, we failed to score. Simmons was lifted for a pinch hitter in the ninth, and Mickey Mantle hit what Barney Schultz called a non-knuckling knuckleball into the seats on the first pitch of the bottom of the ninth to give the Yankees a 2-1 to -one victory and a 2-1 to -one series lead. The way the Yankees pounced on Ray Sadecki in the first inning of the fourth game, it appeared the series would not return to St. Louis. Ray faced four men, they all reached base, and we trailed Al Downing 3 to nothing through the first five innings. Carl Warwick started the sixth with a record-tying pinch single, and Flood also ripped a base hit. Then, after Brock went out, Bobby Richardson couldn't get rid of a potential double play ball. It was an error, and the bases were loaded, but only for a moment. On Downing's second pitch to him, Ken Boyer smacked a grand slammer to give us a 4-3 to three lead that we never relinquished, thanks to great relief pitching from Roger Craig and Ron Taylor. The series was tied again. The fifth game was the most thrilling of the series, Jack. On a sunshiny Monday in New York, Gibson and Stottlemyre hooked up again, but with better results for Cardinal fans. Gibson was great. He led two to nothing as the Yankees batted in the ninth. An error put a runner on first with one away, but Gibson made the defensive play of the World Series to throw out Joe Pepitone. Tom Tresh, however, hit a high fastball into the right center field bleachers to tie things up. In the 10th, Tim McCarver became the hero, belting one out of the ballpark, scoring Boyer and White ahead of him, giving Gibson a 5-2 complete game victory and bringing the Cardinals home with a 3-2 series lead. Everyone in St. Louis seemed confident the Cardinals would wrap it up on Wednesday, October 14th in the sixth game. Everybody, that is, except Yankee right-hander Jim Boughton and his teammates. Joe Pepitone hit a grand slammer. Maris and Mantle belted back-to-back -back homers and Bouton, utilizing a sharp curve to go with his good fastball, was never in serious trouble 
as the Bronx Bombers romp to an 8-3 victory. And again, Cardinal hopes are back to one day, one game, October 15, 1964. 18 years to the day since Enos Slaughter raced home with a run that won the Cardinals the 1946 World's Championship. Again, the call went to Bob Gibson for St. Louis and Mel Stottlemyre for New York. And again, it was gas house baseball that made the difference for the Cardinals. Hooked up in a nothing-nothing fourth-inning tie, the Cardinals got a run when the Yankees messed up another double playgrounder. This one hit by Tim McCarver. Tim moved to third on a Mike Shannon single and scored when a missed hit-and-run sign turned into a Cardinal double steal. A third run subsequently scored on another solid single by Dal Maxville. Boyer and Brock both later homered as Gibson, again working with two days rest, was hit hard in the late innings, but battled his way to a complete game 9-5 to win that ended at 3.41 p.m., sending St. Louis into its most delirious frenzy since the end of World War II. The St. Louis Cardinals were again champions of the world. It has a good sound, Harry, and no team deserved victory more. I hope the fans have enjoyed our recap of the big ones. I hope so too, Jack. But you know, the more I think about 1964, the more one point sticks out in my mind. The World Series was fine, a great one to win, of course. But I'm sure you'll agree that when, many years from now, we get together and reminisce about baseball, and the talk swings around to 1964, one fact will mean more than all the rest. 1964, the year... The Cardinals won the pennant! The Cardinals won the pennant! The Cardinals won the pennant! 